Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Philippe Kahn. Um, Philippe Kahn is an MD, PhD, and a neurologist and a neurophysiologist at the, and a hospital practitioner um, and university professor at Grenoble Alpes uh, University and Hospital in France. That's uh, where he's also in charge of the clinical epileptology program. Um, Philippe is a world leading expert in uh, pre surgical assessment of drug resistant epilepsies and including stereotactic EEG investigations, SEEG for short, uh, with more than 25 years of expertise in the field. Uh, and his uh, area of research includes the characterization of epileptogenic, ep ep epileptogenic, um, sorry, ep epileptogenic networks, we're going to get there, uh, using intracerebral recordings and stimulation. Uh, also, the assessment of physiological networks by analyzing intracranial EEG oscillatory responses uh, in different cognitive tasks and the implementation of novel surgical therapies such as like deep brain um, stimulation. Um, and uh, beyond this formal presentation, I, I have to say that I have um, the huge pleasure of being one of his collaborators over um, uh, the last 10 or 12 years. Um, he's one of those few neurologists and epileptologists with a genuine interest in exploring the neural correlates of healthy cognition um, on top of looking at the clinical applications, of course. Um, and one of the first researchers to actually believe in the potential of high gamma activity as a useful marker or biomarker or neuromarker, both in epilepsy research, but also in cognitive neuroscience research. Uh, one other thing you might not know about Philippe is um, that he's a great bass player. Uh, I know he used to be in a, in, a, in a band, probably a rock or a punk band back in the 80s in France. Um, so if this meeting were to be an um, in-person meeting, we might have had the chance to have Philippe perform for us at the social gathering. But I guess we'll have to wait for the, one of our next meetings uh, to have that pleasure. So that without any further ado, um, c'est un vrai plaisir introduire uh, la présentation de, de Philippe, and it's entitled, What did we learn with direct electrical stimulation of the insulin? Donc Philippe, c'est à toi. Okay, I just need to share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay, better to start with the beginning. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Karim, for this very kind word. And I thank also uh, Dong for this kind invitation to this very nice symposium. Just a correction to what Karim said. I'm definitely not a good bass player. Karim is much, much better than I am. And somewhere, possibly, we will uh, try to play together and uh, if I start to go back with my uh, old uh, passion for music. Okay, so my, uh, my talk today is dedicated to uh, direct vertical stimulation of the insula in humans. And uh, why do we stimulate uh, epileptic patients in, uh, in uh, clinical routine? So, of course, these are epileptic patients that are candidates for epilepsy surgery. And uh, the, the main uh, goals of stimulating the brain in those patients is uh, first to perform functional mapping to avoid any eloquent cortical areas during surgery. Second, to estimate functional connectivity. And these will be the two topics uh, I will uh, deal with. But you can also use uh, electrical stimulation of the, of the brain to assess cortical excitability and to better delineate the epileptogenic region, and also to uh, elicit seizures the way uh, that uh, Penfield did a long time ago in Montreal. So before starting with, uh, with a few presentations that won't be as nice as what Professor Eva showed, uh, just a few words on uh, what we are doing when stimulating the brain. We have to be aware that we absolutely don't know what we are doing, whether we are activating the region or inhibiting, probably depends on the cytoarchitectonic, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, underlined uh, by the stimulation, uh, under the stimulation region. 
Uh, of course, we have to know that the electrodes that we are using, those small uh, stimulate thousands of, uh, of neurons and uh, that we are mainly uh, stimulating uh, pyramidal cells and probably axons uh, much more than uh, uh, body cells. Of course, this will uh, modulate largely a distributed network, so that the interpretation of the clinical symptom that you can elicit by stimulation has uh, to take this uh, into account. And last but not least, uh, we absolutely don't know today what uh, does no response mean, which means you stimulate the cortex at a part where you're expecting to get a clinical response and you don't see anything. So probably the way we are looking at uh, the behavior of the patient during a stimulation procedure is uh, not as good as uh, it should be. As I told you, we are doing this uh, method in epileptic patient and uh, for the insular cortex, definitely the, the best method is a steroid uh, methodology, which consists in uh, implanting depth electrode into the brain, directly into the brain. And uh, you can use different types of uh, electrodes and trajectories, but uh, to reach that region here, which is the insular cortex, probably the best way to do is to put oblique electrodes that uh, can sample a large part of the insular cortex. Of course, you can put in addition lateral orthogonal electrode but you, you pick up the signal from the insular cortex and you stimulate only a very small part of that region. So definitely combining the two, these oblique electrodes and these lateral orthogonal electrodes is probably the best way uh, to sample the insular cortex. There are two different ways to uh, stimulate uh, the brain, including the insular cortex. The first, and this is mainly used for functional mapping purposes, is uh, to use, sorry, this is a mistake, to use the high frequency uh, stimulation around the 50 Hertz. And uh, the second, uh, mainly for uh, seizure induction or excitability purposes, or when you're stimulating fibers, is to use low frequency stimulation. So high frequency stimulation here is uh, probably much better to elicit symptom when stimulating and low frequency stimulation is an ideal tool to look at functional connectivity as I will show you. So just to tell you that what we are stimulating is uh, uh, the way we are stimulating is, uh, is a bipolar stimulation between two contiguous contacts here over the same uh, electrode and um, this is where the stimulation is done bipolarly and in a biphasic way so that uh, it will be safe for the patient. So if we move to what we know, what we believe to know on, uh, on functional mapping of the insular cortex, we have to go back to the Montreal pioneers, uh, which are of course Penfin and Jasper, who were the first to, to publish uh, clinical responses when stimulating the insular cortex, including uh, nausea, epigastric or stomach sensation, abdominal pain, taste uh, sensation or somatosensory uh, symptoms. And then for more than 50 years, uh, insular cortex was stopped to be recorded by clinician because it was at that time considered as too risky to record the insular cortex and not really efficient to treat it. Then came the group of Lyon in the early uh, 2000 that started to reassess the role of the insular cortex in epilepsy. And uh, they include also in their work uh, some uh, functional mapping studies that uh, show very nicely for the first paper that uh, it was possibly it was possible to systematize 
uh, different region within the insular cortex and uh, that uh, pain uh, could be elicited from that region and we go back to that. Then a few uh, additional uh, groups including uh, again a Montreal group uh, published a few studies, I will go back to that and uh, finally and I will mainly focus on that uh, paper back to Lyon with a very nice paper that uh, came out uh, a few years ago, where uh, they obtained in more than 200 patients, more than 500 clinical response within the insular cortex. So this is here, sorry, this is here uh, a summary of uh, the main uh, studies that have been published using uh, stimulation for eliciting symptoms in solar cortex with the last one, the most important coming from the long group. And uh, these are the different uh, categories of symptoms that you can elicit from the insular cortex. So as you can see here on, uh, on that summary here, which uh, will be uh, nearly published in, uh, in the book of, uh, of Dong, uh, you can see that uh, the, the somato, oh, sorry, the somatosensory responses are mainly uh, obtained here uh, by stimulating the posterior part of the insular cortex, mainly the, the anterior and posterior long gyri of the insular cortex. And it's uh, much more easy to elicit paresthesia in that region than uh, thermic sensation and, uh, and, and less than pain. Pain is possibly uh, nevertheless the, the, the most specific uh, clinical response that you can get when stimulating the insula. This is the only part of the brain where you can uh, get so, so, such a, a clinical response. I show you this uh, an example. So this is a left side stimulation of the posterior superior part of the insular cortex here, where the patient complains here of a, a very important pain uh, in the leg. So be careful when stimulating that part of the insular cortex because it's quite, it's quite painful. So these uh, somatosensory responses are elicited in, uh, in, uh, in more than uh, half of the stimulation applied within the insular cortex. And uh, again, that region here in the posterior superior part of the insular cortex is the one which is the most prone to uh, elicit pain. That's interesting because uh, it could be a target uh, for um, deep brain stimulation uh, in painful patients. This is a, a, a study that uh, comes from the Dong and Guyen group, where in six patients, they uh, decided uh, to stimulate the posterior uh, insular cortex and to look at the effect, to stimulate chronically with 150 Hertz uh, stimulation, which is supposed to inhibit the functions is stimulate that region and uh, demonstrate that uh, uh, this, this subclinical uh, stimulation of the posterior insular uh, cortex increase head pain threshold, not only contralaterally, but also ipsilaterally. So this could be uh, an interesting option for painful patient. It has, of course, to be, uh, to be confirmed. So the second most important uh, uh, type of symptom that you can elicit in the insular cortex are visceral sensation, uh, which are mainly constrictive sensations that are very often uh, localized over the, the throat or over the mouth. You can get also abdominal sensation or thoracic sensation, but probably what is the most typical in that region as stimulation that produce uh, this throat sensation. So this is an example of this, very typical. 
It was a right side stimulation, if I remember. So she's asked whether she's doing well and she indicates her throat. This is a, an ascending sensation in the throat. And she, she was even about to, to cry, uh, a sort of uh, intent to cry in that region. So those visceral sensations are mainly elicited here uh, from the anterior insular cortex, but as you can see, there, there is a large overlap with the, the so-called somatosensory and pain thermal region here uh, in between uh, the, the two regions, so that it's very difficult uh, to, to be clear on uh, which is the region which is the most prone to elicit this kind of, of sensation. So if we move uh, forward, uh, all that auditory uh, sensation uh -huh. oops, uh, are elicited here mainly over the inferior and posterior part of uh, the insular cortex. So in a region which is uh, very close to the, the core uh, auditory cortex here, it's different, of course, than what you can get in, in monkeys, but as uh, uh, it was shown previously, you can see that uh, these uh, auditory uh, uh, projections and uh, the fact that you can elicit hallucinations or illusions when stimulating that region matches relatively well to what was shown previously by, by Professor uh, Evar. So the vestibular uh, part of the insular cortex, as assessed by stimulation, uh, is located very close to the so-called auditory uh, insular cortex. And uh, the manifestations that you can elicit in that region are typically rotatory uh, sensation or translational sensation without any clear-cut differences between the two types of symptoms that are elicited by uh, stimulating that region. I am not aware of any studies that have uh, looked at the egocentric or allocentric character of this uh, manifestation. And definitely, it would be interesting to look at, uh, at the, this kind of segregation of the clinical responses. Then uh, came some uh, uh, speech impairment when stimulating the insular cortex. And indeed, in uh, the dominant, but also in the non-dominant insular cortex, you can get here mainly when stimulating that region here, uh, insular cortex, you can get a speech arrest here, which is very close to what you can get, for instance, when stimulating Broca area. So the patient is unable to speak um, and he has even some uh, words finding difficulties. So very close to what you can get again in language area by stimulation. The only difference is that uh, you can remove that part of the insular cortex, even with just such a clinical response, without creating any uh, functional deficit. Interestingly, that region is uh, very close to the region uh, which elicit gustatory or olfactory sensation. That region that was emphasized by Professor uh, Evrar, and uh, it goes into the direction that the mouth and, uh, and possibly throat representation is located here in, uh, in uh, that part of the, of the, the mid uh, insular cortex, the superior part of the, of the third short gyrus of the insular cortex. Last uh, but not least, because this is uh, quite infrequent, uh, Danganguyen and our group uh, were able to um, elicit motor manifestations by stimulating the insular cortex. Uh, I have admit that I don't know exactly what 
create this kind of motor manifestation, it, it's not impossible that uh, the stimulation of the insula, which is very close to the, to the pyramidal tract, could elicit uh, motor symptoms by diffusion of the electrical current. This is typically what you can get here, stimulating the left insular cortex. And you have this kind of, of motor behavior with an extension of the arm and, uh, and uh, a sort of tonic contraction of the, of the arm. Okay, if you're looking at what you can get, uh, by stimulating directly the insular cortex. It matches quite well with uh, what we know from uh, fMRI studies regarding these sensory motor, chemical sensory, social emotor, emotional and cognitive part of the insular cortex. But to be honest, the only problem when stimulating is that it is extremely difficult to get any uh, cognitive manifestation. The only one uh, that, had been, that had been described by stimulating the, uh, the, the cognitive insular cortex is an ecstatic sensation, which is uh, produced here by stimulating the anterior and superior part of the insular cortex. I think that uh, Fabien Picard will go back to this, but just to tell you that uh, when you're stimulating that region and that you produce uh, um, uh, an ecstatic uh, reaction, this is probably due to a change in the connectivity network between that part of the insular cortex and other brain region, especially the anterior part of the temporal lobe and the orbitofrontal region. But the leading structure in such a situation remains the anterior uh, insular cortex. I can skip this. So the, the second part of, of my talk is uh, now to give you a, a few insights on uh, the estimation of the functional connectivity of the insular cortex. And uh, there are only a, a very handful uh, of studies uh, which are used, which have used the CCP cortico-cortical evoked potential methodology to study the insular connectivity. And uh, the different way that you can uh, look at the insular connectivity is uh, intra-insular connectivity, which are the different parts, sub-region of the insular cortex that are connected together. The inter-insular connectivity, which are the link between the insular cortices. And uh, last but not least, the intra-insular connectivity, which are the main efferences from the insular cortex to the other brain region. So one way you can do when uh, dosing uh, cortico-cortical evoked potential is to stimulate uh, the different uh, leads within the insular cortex and to record the, all the other electrode contacts in the different part of uh, the insula, and then to look at the trace and uh, to see or not the evoked potential, which is uh, basically is a N1 component of the evoked contention. So there are region that you can stimulate, but you don't see any CCP. Some that uh, when stimulated show only a, a, a unidirectionality and some that are uh, bilaterally here in blue uh, connected. So in this study coming from the, the group of Lyon, they looked at uh, what happens when stimulating the anterior, mid, and posterior short gyri of the insular cortex, as well as, this, as what happens when stimulating at low frequencies the anterior and posterior long gyri. And uh, to cut a long story short, they mainly show that the, inter, the intra, uh, sorry, insular uh, functional uh, connectivity was quite low 
in the most anterior part of the insular cortex and uh, much more uh, important in the posterior part, especially between the two uh, long insular gyri. If you grossly put here the landmarks between the agranular cortex, disgranular cortex, and uh, granular cortex in the insular cortex, you can see here that there is a, a weak connectivity between a granular and other uh, insular cortex. So here and here, that the connectivity seems quite uh, rich between this granular cortex here and the granular cort cortex. And that the connectivity also seem rich when looking uh, at region with a similar architectony, except for the granular cortex. So rich connectivity here in the disgranular cortex and a rich connectivity there within uh, the granular cortex. The intra-insular functional connectivity is uh, quite uh, unclear. One paper showed that there was a, a very nice cross connectivity between homotopic uh, anterior insular lobe region. Another study demonstrated that there were no interhemispheric connectivity between the right and left posterior insular cortices. Indeed, this cross connectivity between the two insular cortices vary depending on uh, the hemisphere which is stimulated and also uh, depending on the gyrus of the, of the insula which is stimulated. What we have to bear in mind is when you can get this connectivity between the insula, the evoked potential is, uh, is evoked quite quickly. It goes very fast to come from one insular cortex here the right to the left. This is a movie of cortico-cortical evoked potential in one patient. You see here the stimulation and less than 20 milliseconds after, you can see here your evoked potential in the control lateral insular cortex. So it goes very fast when you get these connectivities from one insula to the other one. The last point I would like to go uh, is in extra insular functional connectivity. Uh, one paper, the, the paper of the Lyon group, they demonstrated nicely that all the insula gyri, uh, whatever they are, have a, a rich, quite rich connectivity with the perisylvian region, especially the suprasylvian cortex and the dorsolateral cortex, and according to an anterior to posterior gradient, which means that the most anterior part of the insular cortex connect preferentially to the anterior part of the perisylvian cortex, and so on in the mid and posterior part of the insular cortex. Anyway, and this is a very nice but very complicated study that uh, comes from the group of, of Cleveland, the group of uh, Dilip Nier, and uh, they show using uh, uh, a very special method that uh, the, the connectivity of uh, each gyri of the insular cortex is quite extensive and uh, complex. I don't want to go into details for that study, but what uh, is represented here is a so-called uh, circle plot, where you represent all the region that have been recorded and stimulated here on the right hemisphere here and on the left hemisphere here. You see here your stimulation site in the anterior, mid, posterior, short gyri of the insular cortex, anterior and posterior long gyri of the insular cortex here. And uh, just to make things uh, very simple, 
uh, the darker is the is the link here the higher is the, is the connectivity and the the, the darker is the, is the color the via the less is the, the lesser is the, is the variability between between uh, stimulation at the same site so the first thing that uh, you can see using looking at, uh, at those different maps is that the connectivity is extremely extensive and complex and seems to be more frequently uh, bilateral at the most anterior part of the insular cortex that uh, what you can see here over the most posterior part of the insular cortex. What the authors show also is that when they are looking at those different regions that are represented here and compared to what we know on the different uh, classical networks, such as science network, uh, language network, and so on, they found that uh, the right insular cortex was uh, mainly dedicated to uh, sensory pain, vestibular, and uh, saliency uh, processing, while the dominant uh, insular cortex here was uh, much more dedicated to, uh, to the, the so-called uh, language uh, network. Also, what they found, and that's interesting, is that uh, most, if not all, uh, gyri of the insular cortex were uh, connected with uh, Escher gyrus, whatever the side of stimulation, which means that uh, you have uh, this uh, bilateral representation of the auditory cortex that you have this bilateral projection to the auditory cortex that can be uh, elicited by stimulating the, the insula. The second point that uh, they show is that the ipsilateral connection to the hippocampal formation is quite frequent, uh, whatever the, the, the gyrus which is uh, stimulating. So, the idea that uh, the connection between the insula cortex with the hippocampus is more important in the posterior than in the anterior part, as it was suspected based on seizure analysis, does not seem uh, to be true at terms when looking at functional connectivity. So one last way to look at uh, cortico-cortical uh, evoked potential is to try to make uh, statistic statistical maps of those potential. And uh, Olivier David in Grenoble, but now he has moved to, to Marseille, has uh, made a huge work in this domain and has developed uh, this uh, so-called probabilistic functional tractography of the human brain, thought to go very quickly, you record here cortico-cortical evoked potential. These are your recorded data. You filtering uh, your artifact, and then you see here nicely your CCP uh, filter. And then by enlarging the window of analysis, you can uh, estimate the amplitude of your CCP, but also the latency, which uh, correspond here to the peak of the N1 component of the, of the CCP. What was very original in the work of, uh, of Olivier David was that uh, he presents the, the results using a neuroimaging approach so that uh, you can uh, make an analysis at the individual level, but also at uh, a group level, for instance here, for amygdala stimulation in more than 80 patients, you can see here your connectivity probability map. So which are the region that are the most likely to be connected with in amygdala stimulation. 
but you can have also a connectivity latency map where you can see here the latency with which, for instance, the amygdala uh, connects here uh, to um, the anterior part of, I think, the thangulate here. Oop. So that's very interesting, not only to have uh, the, the map of the region that are the more prone to be connected with a stimulated region, but you can get also the latency with which the evoke potential is elicited when stimulated that region. So for the insular cortex, uh, Olivier and uh, Leila Ayubian recently did the work using uh, now the F-Tract database, which uh, include more than uh, 800 uh, patients. So they did the work on uh, 300 patients that were stimulating stimulated in the insular cortex and they use the, the Lausanne parcellation map, which means that you have uh, 130 parcels uh, that you can use uh, for looking at your cortico-cortical uh, evoked potential. So what you can see here on those two maps is that the connectivity probability is quite close to, uh, the, con to the, the map that is given by the N1 latency of the evoked potential, which means that uh, uh, your CCP propagates first and with a very high probability uh, around the DCS site here, and then to homologous region here, and later to much more distal region within the brain. And the second point is those areas with a fast propagation here and uh, with the highest connectivity probability are probably regions that are systematically and directly connected to the insula. So when looking at those kind of maps, it's probably better to look uh, the part of the parcels uh, where the cognitivity probability is high and the latency is, uh, is, uh, is uh, short. Philippe, you have one minute left, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I think I will have finished. Thanks. So if you just look at the probability map, uh, what you can see when stimulating the posterior insular cortex is that the response is quite similar between the left and right insular cortex. The connectivity, which is the most important, uh, is the connectivity within the posterior insular cortex, which means that it, it stays first very closely to that region. And then the regions that are the most closely connected to the posterior insular cortex are those perisylvian area, especially in their posterior part, and the caudal part of the anterior cingulate cortex. And you can see this on both sides. Interestingly, you can see that the connectivity, which is a bit low here on the contralateral hemisphere, uh, is, uh, is uh, done between uh, the two posterior insular cortex and between those uh, anterior uh, mesial territories. In the left and right anterior cortex, again, the maps are uh, quite similar with uh, the high probability to be connected within the anterior insular cortex with a subtle difference with the left where pass uh, opercularis of, of Broca is also uh, closely connected. And then the second probability to be connected to that region is much more anterior than with the posterior insular cortex, including the pass um, orbitalis and triangularis on both sides, and also the cingulate 
and uh, the cingulate more rostral than uh, what was observed in the stimulation of the posterior cortex. So I will end there, there just to summarize the few things on the functional mapping and the functional connectivity of the insular cortex. The res clinical responses to insular stimulation uh, are multiple and uh, show only a partial segregation with some uh, overlaps. Interestingly, cognitive, emotional, and motor responses are quite rare, but this is probably a technical uh, problem of the stimulation. The anterior insular cortex shows the less intrainsular connectivity than the posterior insular cortex, and uh, both subdivisions are densely connected ipsilaterally, more anteriorly for the anterior insula and more posteriorly for the posterior one. And the contralateral connections are not rare when stimulating the insula, notably between the homologous region of uh, insular subdivision. So I thank you and sorry to have outpassed my time. <laughs>